Coming up on Tech News Today, GoDaddy and Google take down the Daily Stormer. Snapchat combines the snaps of concert goers with CrowdSurf. Microsoft internal documents show the struggle of Surface behind the scenes. And we unbox the new Asus Zenfone AR. It's Google's next and latest AR phone. All that and more coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1831, recorded Monday, August 14th, 2017. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by the Ring Video Doorbell. With Ring, you can see and talk to anyone at your door from anywhere in the world using your smartphone. It's like caller ID for your home. Go to ring.com slash TNT and get up to $150 off a Ring of Security kit. Welcome to Tech News Today. This is the show where we do our best to entertain you with the tech news so that you can avoid the regular news. Oh, yeah. I'm Megan Maroney. I'm Jason Howell. Boy, we did a really poor job of that t on today's show. We did. We've got some, we've got some stories in there. Yeah, some uh, upsetting <laughs> regular news is also tech news. Yeah, you know, we... it's sometimes it, it, it crosses that way, mm -hmm. so we're just going to have to do it. Yep. So let's do it. If you have shielded yourself from non-tech news over the weekend, I regret to inform you that racist white supremacist incited violence over the weekend in Virginia, leading to at least one death. One white supremacist website, The Daily Stormer, was hosted by GoDaddy until late last night when the site was given 24 hours to move its domain off the service for violating GoDaddy's terms of service by encouraging additional violence. Now today, many news outlets are reporting that Google has also refused to host the site. Now, Google said uh, that they are refusing to host it because the site, as GoDaddy said, incites violence, and uh, but that's not actually in their terms of service. Uh, Russell Brandon points out uh, in Ars Technica that the Google privacy policy does include provisions, this is his quote, against using who is privacy settings in order to conceal involvement with activities that are bigoted based on racial, ethnic, or political grounds. Yeah, I mean, this is like a per perfect storm, for lack of a better word, uh, for, for Google um, right now. Like this last week has been incredibly politicized for not just this situation, for them removing the Daily Stormer so quickly after after registering the domain, but also last week and the, the uh, manifesto and kind of the fallout from that. So Google's really kind of they've got to be feeling the heat right now because this is just one thing after another. Maybe it's just everything, every, like the world is feeling the heat right now. It really feels like all eyes are on this sort of thing and just the amount of pressure that comes along with that. I imagine Google is doing what it felt it needed to in light of also what Google, uh, what GoDaddy had chosen to do, but they're not alone. Um, Airbnb actually prior to the rally had removed users that they discovered were booking for the Unite the Right. They heard about logistics that were being coordinated on the Daily Stormer. It was on a message board, something that said, you know, we're close to filling our seventh house. We have 80 to 90 people and are a mix of various alt-right groups. They then matched the names, from what I understand, and booted um, those bookings out of the system. So Airbnb kind of making a statement as well. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, it's hard to believe that what happened at Google last week, the response uh, to James Damore's uh, memo, wasn't part of the bigger political picture right mm -hmm. now. I mean, oh, it absolutely. Just, it just is. The reaction and on both sides, it's all, uh, it's all just how everyone is feeling right now and the way that people are communicating. And so, yeah, I mean, I... Uh, I think it's it's if you violate the terms of service, then you violate the terms of service. And, you know, inciting violence is not OK. Everyone is, you know, I believe in the right to free speech. Um, these are private companies, so it doesn't count. Um, and, you know, yelling fire in a crowded theater is not free speech. And neither is some of the things that happened over the weekend. It is also interesting to see. Um, I don't know if you heard about this morning, the whole anonymous aspect of the Daily Stormer site where, Basically, if you went to the Daily Stormer site, there was almost a full, it wasn't a complete takeover of the page, but it was everything that you saw. And then below that, you would find, you know, the, the standard Daily Stormer 
news items and ad ad units and all that kind of stuff. But it was basically made up to look as if Anonymous had taken over the site. And it essentially said, Anonymous, we are against, you know, these, this dangerous, you know, the, the dangerous um, beliefs, you know, that are uh, that are put onto this site. And in the next 24 hours, we're going to take the site offline. Anonymous has since come out to say they have no idea of anyone within Anonymous that actually did that, and which kind of seems to point it towards the Daily Stormer possibly, and I don't know if this is just one ex explanation of many, but possibly kind of faking an Anonymous takeover of the site to get people more enraged and also to explain why the site might actually disappear in 24 hours uh, for anyone who might not know about the terms of service violations that's kicking them off of you know GoDaddy and Google. So messy. Yes, it's technology. It's also, you know, the, the bigger picture, like you said, it's it's all in this one big group and it's hard to avoid and it's just really depressing. Mm -hmm. There are other websites that all, uh, there are white supremacist websites that are still up. Yeah. I won't name them, but uh, they they are still up. And I mean, it, it needs to be said also that GoDaddy didn't just say, oh, you know, hey, let's look through our, you know, the people that use our service and see if anyone's violating it. It, it was pressure from people mm. saying, you are hosting this site, here's what they're posting, this is against your terms of service. And and in the beginning, they didn't, uh, you know, before th before this weekend. Right. They were more of the, you know, this site can be up, it's, you know, it's, you know, everyone deserves to have a website, um, in their opinion, um, but, you know, they changed their mind. Yeah, I mean, big, you know, catastrophic events like this uh, will definitely change minds and change the focus, and that's what happened there. Snapchat has released a new feature in its stories section that, at least in this case, should make music fans happy. Crowdsurf is a new way to take Snapchat videos recorded at big events and then merge them into an interactive viewing experience that puts the viewer in control. It's kind of hard to explain. I'll, I'll do my best. Snapchat demoed the new feature using a, a collective footage that was taken at the outside land festival i think it was last weekend in san francisco where a musician lord was performing snapchat has collected and synced up videos taken from the many users at the performance in the audience so then as a viewer you hit play and it basically switches between the videos as a song that was recorded plays as the audio of that is synced up so one kind of key chunk of music that sounds I'm, I'm hoping they pick the one that sounds the best is kind of the time base for all of these videos that were also recorded at the same time to be synced to and then you as a viewer you can just like tap a button and change your perspective and see it from different angles and uh, it's just kind of a, a, a cool way to kind of bring everybody's collective sharing together into an interactive experience I really like it I am of two minds of this. I, I played it on my Snapchat um, and I watched it. Some of the some of the microphones are drastically better. Yeah, than others. oh for sure. And it, it's only a it small. Was all over the place. It's only a small chunk. And so yeah, I mean it was it was enjoyable. Uh, the name spot on, CrowdSurf. I like that because you can actually click and go to different views. Mm -hmm. Like you can see the screen. You know, you can. You, a lot of what you see is other people's heads, much like the regular concert experience. <laughs> um, and in the other side, I hate it. I absolutely hate it because I went to see Kendrick Lamar last a couple of weeks ago and everyone, it was the first concert I'd seen in a long time and everyone is Snapchatting. Oh, everybody's everyone holding is their Snapchatting phone up right in front of your view. <laughs> you can't see around it because their phone's in I front mean, of you. <laughs> I don't mind that so much yeah. as like, I just want to be the mom at the concerts that, that's like, enjoy it, enjoy it, be in the moment, be, you know, and <laughs> I didn't do that. Um, I kept it to myself. I, I might have taken a few pictures myself, yeah. but, um, but yeah, I think anything that encourages people to do more of that. And this is also sort of encouraging people not to go to concerts. Like, well, why would I go when I can just watch it on mm. Snapchat? And my other, the other reason I hate it is um, because <laughs> I have a lot of hate in me today. <laughs> Sorry about Snapchat. Um, is that I, I wish AI were being used for something better than this. And yeah. I know it is, and we're going to talk about that later, but it's just like, that's a lot of, um, I don't know, that's a lot of neural network to try to sync up a song so that you can, you know, see other people's concert Snapchat videos. AI can do a lot of things. Mm -hmm. It can also do this. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I guess I don't see it as like, well, if, it's do, if you're doing this with AI, then you're not doing something else. I mean, if you're creating a product, especially a product like Snapchat that is all based around you know, very, very particular group of people having fun with, like, they're going to use it if they're having a good time using it. And this is definitely, I think, a feature that encourages people to have fun with the service. 
Um, they might be recording videos or taking pictures anyways. It just mm-hmm. so happens that they're they're sharing it on Snapchat, and then Snapchat is saying, oh, wouldn't you know it, this, this, and this clip were all recorded at exactly the same time. Sync them up and, you know, give a new experience. I've actually, I've, I think one of the reasons that I really like this it's not that I thought of this first at all, but I re- remember years ago. <laughs> you did. You where, thought of this. No, That's- no, no. And it's not related to this, but I remembered years ago how cool it would be if there was some way to take like, you know, you're, you're walking the streets of San Francisco as a tourist and somebody over there takes a picture of someone else and you happen to be in the background. How cool it would be for me to be able to find those pictures that like I'm in the background and to remember that because that wasn't necessarily a picture that I intended to take or a moment that I intended to capture. But wouldn't it be neat to relive it in, in through the the sense of, oh, well, I just happened to be there and hey, somebody else took it and be able to connect it to it. This just kind of reminded me of that. This like kind of way of, of capturing what so many people are doing independently and, and removed from each other and then uniting it into one thing that everybody can enjoy. Okay. You've, you've taught me not to hate, but to love. Okay. Jason, thank you. <laughs> Maybe you don't even have to love it. Just go, mm, that's cool. Okay. So, so what if it were a different use case besides a Lord concert? Like, don't yeah. get me wrong. I love Lord. But if it were like the Gettysburg address or something like that, you know, and you could, you you could, could hear be time. there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So if you could go back in time and everyone could be Snapchatting the Gettysburg agre- address. That would be a good use of artificial intelligence as <laughs> far mean, as I'm concerned. The next Gettysburg address. <laughs> the next one, whatever it happens to be. <laughs> uh, Burke would like to say that he wishes they would unite to not use wow. vertical video. That's not going to happen, mm-hmm. Burke. It's just, mm-hmm. it's, it's part of the Snapchat way. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Paul Therott has obtained a leaked Microsoft memo that reveals how the company plans to deal with the fallout from Consumer Reports' bad reliability rating of all Surface products. The memo also included a chart with return rates for a Surface Book that reached 17% during launch and then remained above 10%. For six months after that, the Surface Pro 4 return rate hit 16% during launch and then dropped below 10% after that first month. And the Surface Pro 3 return rates, those those were much lower. The return rates were much lower, so it was a more successful product at launch. Uh, Thoreau, Thoreau has been covering this story for a while. He says that Microsoft originally blamed Surface the Surface problems on Intel. But sources at the company tell him the real problem was Surface-specific custom drivers and that Microsoft made up the story about it all being Intel's fault. Ooh, dishy. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I was trying, and I had a really hard time. I, I realized I probably just don't know the right way to discover to figure it out what average industry and in return rates mm-hmm. are, because I mean, yes, ten to seventeen percent seems high. I want to know what to compare it to. Like, you know, the average phone that goes out there or the average tablet or, or laptop, is it 5%? I'm guessing like a lot of people it, it, in my searching seem to come back with 5%. I couldn't find any specific like report or, or something that that detailed that. But regardless, it's a pretty high return rate. And, um, you know, but Consumer Reports, they were saying around 25% encountered problems in the second year. So maybe that's a little better. I don't know, 25% of issues how does that translate into people that actually are motivated to return? I don't mm-hmm. know. Well, and also what Microsoft said in this memo was, you know, that could be like the screen freezing or yeah. something else that could have been, you know, solved. Uh, yeah, he doesn't talk about, Therat doesn't talk about what the regular return rate is. He does say this, the net promoter score is something that they talk about. Um, and it's consistently higher than that of other OEMs. Um, but that's other PC makers. And he points out, Paul points out that that is uh, probably Apple is is higher than oh, okay. the Surface, but you know, other it's better than other PC makers. And I said this hmm. on, we talked about this again on Friday with Georgia because, um, you know, Microsoft was pushing the story that this is, um, you know, th- these are old products and, you know, the new products aren't, you know, rated yet. And, and you know, it's like, yes, they are new to hardware. We forget that. And um, so does that mean that we need to give them a break? Uh, maybe. I don't know. I'm, I'm perfectly happy with uh, Leo's Surface Book that I use, um, but I don't use it very much, mm-hmm. as you can see. <laughs> you're, you, yeah, you go back and forth. You, you're an equal opportunity. Yeah, maybe. mostly I go back, not so much forth. <laughs> okay, <laughs> maybe not. Yeah, I mean, you know, they were. Um, it, it sounded like, based on on reading through this, that this was not at least the issue with Skylake, the the power management issues was not 
specific to just Microsoft's devices. That was a wider issue. It was just how Microsoft was able to respond to it was not nearly as fast as anyone else. So, you know, and that, as you said, comes down to firmware, comes down to drivers and I guess lack of, I don't know, hardware's hard, you know, mm -hmm. lack of experience on Microsoft's part, which is a strange thing to say because Microsoft is what Microsoft is, but there you go. Netflix sees Disney pulling its catalog from the service and counters with Shonda Rhimes. She is one of the premier producers in television with hits like Grey's Anatomy, Scandal, and How to Get Away with Murder. And she's been signed to a $10 million per year exclusive deal for Netflix, Netflix wooed away from ABC and Disney. It's got to hurt. After 15 years generating more than $2 billion for the company, Rhimes will be developing new shows for Netflix further illustrates the kind of money the company is willing to pour into creating exclusive new content instead of just relying on the content supplied by Hollywood Studios. We also heard over the weekend that David Letterman, who had retired in 2015 after 33 years in late night TV, is going to come to Netflix, at least in a limited sense initially, as Netflix does, signed to a six one-hour episodes for a new interview show and then beyond. But um, it, I think what, what captured my, my imagination on this one is thinking about Netflix in like the five year plan and thinking of a Netflix service where the whole beginnings of it relying on ho Hollywood movies and, and TV shows. And let's face it, not always the best, you know, film and video content in the world, but something kind of goes to the wayside even further than it is right now. And Netflix just is an HBO, you know, is a, or is a hit maker instead of just a, a, a sort of hit, um, I don't know, streaming service. Yeah. I mean, we think of Netflix as being such an original idea, but you're right. Like it's basically just HBO at this yeah. point. It's a service that you're paying extra for because you like the content that's on it and nowhere else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I love Shonda Rhimes. I am a big fan of her. Um, and so I'm excited about this. Uh, she also lured my own daughter away from Disney because um, she moved from Disney straight to Grey's Anatomy. She's watched all uh, every episode of every single uh, season, which is like a billion. And she's basically a doctor now from watching all this. So thank, thank you, <laughs> Shonda Rhimes. Uh, That's all it takes. But this is a real like this is a real battle for yeah. talent, which is yeah. exciting if you love stories. Uh, and, and you love wa watching interesting stories. Amazon hired Robert Kirkman um, of The Walking Dead. Uh, and, you know, you mentioned David Letterman. Netflix also hired Joel and Ethan Cohen. So oh, it yeah, really that's is. Right. And, you know, I always am excited to see anyone that can threaten Disney. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll, not threaten them like, you know. Really. But can challenge them. Challenge. Right? Challenge. That's a better word. Although, <laughs> at the, the same time, Man, is it is it? Are we getting to the point to where every single studio, every single network is going to have its own twelve dollar a month streaming service, and that's a la carte? Like we had this, we had this dream, this vision of what a la carte, you know, would be, and the the move to kind of changing how video and film is delivered, going from cable and satellite onto the internet, and instead we're going to have to pick the studios that we love so much we have to have all of their stuff instead of having a big mix and i'm not sure that's the best case scenario either but yeah. it seems like that's kind of where we're headed mm -hmm. coming up we'll take a first look at google's latest uh, stab at augmented reality but first let's take a minute to thank ring they're the sponsor of this episode. Ring's mission is to make neighborhoods safer. Today, over a million people use the amazing Ring video doorbell to help protect their homes. I use it. I love it. It's awesome. I, I, I turn on cloud streaming of the video, especially when I go out of town and it keeps a catalog of anything that's happened at my door while I'm gone. It's just makes you feel, it gives you peace of mind. Uh, Ring knows home security begins at the front door, but it doesn't end there. That's why they're extending that same level of security to the rest of your home with the Ring floodlight cam. Just like Ring's video doorbell, floodlight cam is a motion activated camera and floodlight that connects to your phone. With HD video and two-way audio, it lets you know the moment anyone steps on your property. See and speak to visitors, even set off an alarm right from your phone. With Ring's floodlight cam, when things go bump in the night, you'll immediately know what it is. Whether you're home or away, the Ring floodlight cam lets you keep an eye on your home. Ring floodlight cams offer the ultimate in-home security with high visibility floodlights and a powerful HD camera that puts security in your hands. 
named the Wall Street Journal's best of CES 2017. You can monitor every corner of your property with a ring of security kit. All of those kits include a ring video doorbell and your choice of either one, two, or three floodlight cams. Connect your ring video doorbell with your favorite smart locks and hubs for added convenience, monitoring, and security. It's really all about making your home even smarter. With Ring, you're always home. Save up to $150 off a Ring of Security kit when you go to ring.com slash TNT. That's ring.com slash TNT, and we thank Ring for their support. Google has been playing the long game when it comes to its augmented reality products. Arguably, it really hit the public sphere first when they unveiled Google Glass back in 2012. But that type of AR was a bit less, I don't know, interactive when compared to what we're starting to see now. Project Tango has been Google's experimental technology that uses specialized sensors on the phone to merge virtual elements with real world elements on screen. First, we heard of Project Tango was 2014 as an experimental prototype phone dubbed the Peanut. It was kind of cute, but a little bulky. Followed later that year by a seven inch tablet that was sold as part of the Tango dev kit. Lenovo f uh, released the first consumer Tango device last year, the Lenovo uh, Fab 2 Pro, and it was really like huge. So it wasn't, didn't feel super mainstream. And now the Asus Zenfone AR is hoping to take Tango uh, even more mainstream. I just got it delivered this afternoon. I've got it in this box. And figured, you know, what's the fun of like opening a box on my own? I I, mm -hmm. I can't open these things if if you know you guys aren't watching or yeah. if you aren't sitting next to me. Right. Like if why? You, if you open a box and no one's uh, recording it, <laughs> are you opening the box? At no, all? you're I not, Megan. So. You're not at all. So so we got this. So basically, the Zenfone AR is uh, is Asus's take on taking Project Tango and kind of the promise of Google's flavor of, of augmented reality and taking it, a like I said, a little bit more mainstream. So what you end up with is a phone that actually looks like any other phone, right? Like it's super thin on, on Tango devices in the past. It, the sensors on the back and everything, it just felt huge and bulky and big. And I got to say, this is a really nice uh, thin, Ooh, thin build. What's going is, on on the back there? Well, this is... <laughs> This is the plastic. This is the fun no, part I mean, of a box. How many cameras is that? Oh yeah. Okay. So the Asus. Uh, so they call it the TriCam uh, system. So you've got a 23 megapixel rear facing camera for high res uh, high resolution detail of everything that the camera sees. Really high res. That also helps for identifying objects for uh, for tracking too. You've got a motion tracking camera that's using a fisheye lens. Uh, for tracking your, your motion through space, obviously, and then depth sensing camera uh, using IR infrared uh, projector for measuring distances between items. So basically what Tango is doing is it's taking all those three data sets, those data points that are generated through those three cameras, and kind of combining them to have kind of a highly accurate map of of your surroundings of the room and where the phone is in space in relation to all of the objects that are there. So you could take it to a Lord concert, per se, and then record from many different angles? You know me so well, <laughs> Megan. I would take this to the Lord concert, even though I couldn't even tell you a single Lord song. But yes, you could totally do that. <laughs> uh, and, you know, another thing that they're, they're also talking about on this is uh, storing map information of spaces and possibly sharing that with other Tango devices for mapping areas or in stores and, uh, you know, to help you, like if you go into a hardware store and you have a hard time finding where, where the, uh, I don't know, the screwdrivers are, potentially you could use your phone to navigate through there. Mm. And just like you would out in the street, uh, navigate, you can navigate through, uh, through the stores. So I noticed there are bezels there, even though we're moving towards a bezel-less society. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, the side bezels aren't that bad, but yes, you've got top and bottom bezels, fingerprint reader down yeah, the there. Side is that, is not, that not a fingerprint reader? Actually, I don't even know that that is a fingerprint reader. Um, uh, yeah, so anyways. Burke wants us to skip to the good part, which is how much uh, it costs, which I would say is not the good part, but the bad part. It's $600. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it is $600 for the 64 gig, uh, 64 gigs of internal storage, six gigs of RAM. So it's got a lot of RAM, $699 for 128 gigs, eight gigs of RAM. So, I mean, I think price-wise it's on par with a lot of Android, kind of premium Android devices. If, yeah, right right, right around there, it's, it's pretty on par. I think that the big detractor, the big downside to something like this is that, well, okay, I guess the upside is that Project Tango for AR 
uh, is a lot more, I would say, exact, precise than AR, than what we know about AR kit, or at least it, it should be more precise. The, the extra sensors on here are give a little bit more information, a little bit more data than um, the iPhone's uh, dual camera setup, mm -hmm. right? That can provide a piece of it, but that's not all that you're getting here. But I think the downside is someone really has to be intent, like it has to be their intention mm -hmm. that they want to get in on Project Tango and then can convince themselves that that it's worth it to them enough to buy a phone specifically dedicated to that. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that's going to do in the marketplace. Right. I don't know how that's going to work out over right. time. And so I do wonder if the iPhone 8 will have better, even better capabilities than the iPhone 7 for um, for recording. Mm -hmm. We don't know yet. Um, but I, I, I think this is great for developers and it's great for like super technical Android users who want the newest cool thing. Um, but I don't know that anyone else, a regu any other regular people would buy it. I mean, they, they're always pushing the, like, redecorating your home for AR. Like, here's where you'd place your chair, and here's where you would put the couch and that painting on the wall. But, in, I mean, how many times are you going to redo your home? I mean, hopefully not once every couple of years, or else you might have a problem. Just saying. Yeah, no, that's that's a really good point. I mean, I think that's, whoa. Okay, Was so take my camera out? for a second. Did you, are you already AR-ing? So I, I skipped through. So basically it's mapped the table you can see, right? Those are all the points of the table. Ooh, there's my And hand. it's starting to oh. give me things on the table. <gasps> oh, but I don't see the table. Well, I just see a unicorn or something. I'm well, it like. took, well, <laughs> the, the space that it mapped is what you're seeing on the ground there. It basically did a 3D map of the table and off the edge is where you see all that stuff in the background coming out of. So if we had cut to it a little bit earlier, you would have oh. seen kind of like the, the 3D mapping mm -hmm. that was that was taking place. But, can you um, start it over? I don't know if I can start it over, but it's a beautiful scene, isn't it? We've got, exit on the bottom right. Yeah, I'll do the exit and see what it does. Maybe it'll take us somewhere <gasps> fun. Oh, no, oh. I exited it at the wrong time. Okay, okay, so now it's... And now we're back to normal. Okay. Um, but anyways, that's kind of a part of it. You saw it there at the very beginning. Um, part of what t is interesting, I feel like, about Tango is that it really, it starts... It starts with a mode to where you have to basically learn your space. You move it around and it realizes there's a wall right there and there's a table right here and off the edge of the table, there's chairs over there. And so it can map elements to those particular things. So what you saw there was a grassy scene that was based on the map of this table and off the edge, you saw the stuff coming out of the background. Um, and, and there are other elements of AR that actually do camera pass through so that you see the stuff like you were mm -hmm. expecting to see, you see the table and then you see something dancing on top of it. Now I just, I just installed and launched this. So that's pretty impressive. You saw him taking the plastic off. It's for real. Yeah. Um, so was that just a demo? Like what was it that you clicked that started that? It, it just did that right when I fired it up and mm -hmm. I, I just launched the app. There's a Tango app on it. And so it says discover Tango and maybe it'll do it again here. If I launch it again, you can kind of see it uh, go through, but there's a Snapdragon 821 uh, processor inside. It says walk to explore. Yeah. So there's me. There you are. Oh, it's mapping me. Yeah. It's mapping feels. you. Okay. See, and as I move it around, it draws more pieces of the space, right? It's, detecting all that stuff and there was there's a our unicorn yeah, with two horns our wonderful unicorn and <laughs> once you have enough uh, of the space mapped then it kind of realizes the space and gives you the experience oh, like that whoa pretty neat uh i will be very curious to play around with this uh and and see if it's worth the money verizon will actually be the exclusive carrier partner so if you wanted to if you were holding out for the carrier experience to be like, oh, well, this will never fly because you won't find any carriers, you will in Verizon uh, if you, if this is uh, sounds like your cup of tea. And so, you know, uh, I will probably be doing a little bit more of a deep dive on it tomorrow and all about Android. And I think not this weekend, but next weekend, I'll be reviewing it for new screensavers. Uh, but new technology, I've been really looking forward to this, so I'm super excited to play around with it. Awesome. Yeah. Well, we got a fantastic email from Melissa who wrote, I have been really intrigued by the conversations you, Jason, Leo, Georgia Dow at all have been having regarding kids, screen time, and the challenges of parenting. 
I do not have kids myself and do not have to worry about my dog evolving opposable thumbs and starting to check Twitter for me. So my interest has been that of one with an outside perspective. You've given me things to consider when hiring the next generation of pe people, which will be coming up in technology. I am in charge of, a network, of network and telecom engineers. I already have had experience with what people call millennials. And yes, they are different, not in a good or bad way, just different, which must be taken into consideration not only when hiring, but when blending them in with colleagues of different generations. Yes, there is some, those kids today, get off my lawn from older generations. But I think something you said the other day about just not, about not just being kids affected by screen time, but all of us is spot on. Melissa, this was a very long email, which I really appreciated. She went on to talk about how she got into technology very early with CompuServe and BBS and IRC. Oh, yeah. And her parents had no idea what she was doing. And she says she could have easily have been involved in drugs or hacking or white supremacy. supremacy. Uh, and she wasn't. And her, par her parents didn't know. This is what she was connecting. And um, she had some other really interesting thoughts about just, just the way she connects. She travels all over the world and so doesn't really even have the home base. And so virtually, virtual connection is really important to her. So yeah, I th thank you, Melissa, for your yeah. perspective. And it is true that many of us uh, grew up, my, my dad always knew about technology. My mom, you know, somewhat, she was paying attention to what I was doing. But I think a lot of us, um, maybe even some of us sitting at this table were doing things their, their parents didn't know anything about. I don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> Megan Maroney. Although I do I do completely identify with what Melissa is saying here. You know, uh, BBSs, CompuServe, uh, getting into trouble with BBSs. Yes, I had a little bit of that when I was a kid. But hey, we, we live and we learn. My parents, for their part, were so clueless to technology, they had no idea what I was doing, what a BBS was or what a modem was. So, you know, I couldn't fault them for that. But that, that was a different, I feel like that was a very different time. Like they, there was just less awareness about about that type of technology, unless you were a total enthusiast. Now, it's so incredibly pervasive and mainstream. You know, everybody is exposed to the power of the internet and the reaches, you know, of, of technology and, and everything. Now we're kind of at the point to where we're so saturated with it that we're like, okay, well, now what? Like, what, what does this lead to being so incredibly engulfed and saturated by it? Yeah, I mean, but there's still, I mean, you would be surprised. There's still some really uh, glaring blank spots and a lot of parents... You know, there's just, just the things that we talk about. Like there's, you know, kids have one Instagram account mm -hmm. um, that they let their parents follow and then they have another one that they don't. And I've I've mentioned that to parents and they're like, what? And, you know, and it's just, it, it's sometimes it's just a lack of knowledge and sometimes it's, you know, we're just busy lives. I mean, what yep. Melissa pointed out, like sometimes we are also so connected to our technology that we're not paying attention to our kids. And mm -hmm. I don't say like those parents aren't. I say we, meaning me sometimes too. And so I think that that's, that's part of it too. And sometimes there's a willful, like, oh, I don't want to know what they're doing. It hurts too much. But, um, <laughs> so, but you know, what she said about us was that we, uh, we do know a little more than, and probably most of you listening also know a little more. Um, and so it is a little more terrifying than it is to the average person who yeah. doesn't, doesn't know. Yeah, that's a really good point. Mm -hmm. TNT's fan of the day is Richard Chanda on Google+. Plus, and I don't know how this one got past us, but it did. Check this out. Richard says, I usually just listen, uh, but, to, but to TNT, instead this time he recorded a video that shows him back in February latched on the top of a super tall tower. And we'll see it here in a second. There we go. Okay, so if you skip around to 16 seconds here, uh, and, you, and you'll it'll pull out here and it'll show you where it actually is. And then we get the view down, and that's where my skin starts to crawl because this is like my worst nightmare. Oh, he's at the very top of this tall tower just hanging on. No big deal. Watching TNT on a phone. Most of the business, like you said, most yeah. of the business uh, Ball, uh, I, I just don't even know what to do with that. It like so my fingers hurt right now. <laughs> I am scared. Just I know. Being, like I, I feel like I was up there. I could <laughs> have fallen. <laughs> Me too. That, that is amazing. That 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 goes up in the one one of the the best. Yeah, that's that's one of the coolest, and I can't believe that it took us this long to put it on the show. But we found it, and we did. And thank you for sending it in and being so patient with us. Uh, show us how you watch or listen to TNT, but you know, be safe. Uh, just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup. You can post it on Instagram, Google Plus, Twitter, or Facebook, and use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT, and we're gonna find it. 
And amidst all of this news that we've had over the weekend, uh, there is one thing we can rejoice about. New MIT research that says artificial intelligence can reduce video buffering at long last. The MIT CSAIL project is called Pensiv, and it's able to choose different algorithms depending on the network connection to, to slow down the buffering, speed up your video. Video from YouTube and Netflix will be broken up into pieces, and then each separate piece will play at a different resolution based on what the algorithm says. So tests show 10 to 30% less buffering. It could potentially be used in VR in the future. And uh, I guess clearly this is a way for the robots to keep us, uh, you know, distracted while they become our overlords. Hmm. Watch more video. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this really basically revolves around um, adaptive bitrate algorithms that are already kind of used on video services and it, it you know and you end up seeing the results of this if your network takes a dive and suddenly your crisp video gets all broken up and and you know and uh, pixelated that's because it's an adaptive bit rate and it's saying well you have less bit rate or you have less bandwidth so we're going to serve you this lower bit rate video or if you scan ahead in a video that hasn't already buffered that part then you get the loading and then you have to wait for it to kind of load that particular moment in time and then beyond. And the challenge, from what I understand, stood through reading through this, is the challenge is knowing which is the best way to kind of serve that material up to the person on the other end based on the network conditions. And this artificial intelligence is able to work with both of those uh, scenarios, both of those behaviors, and over time understand based on a network condition, which uh, behavior is the best way to approach it or what bit rate or, you know, what kind of, um, what kind of buffering around that it, it's able to load up. So like, I feel like I like three quarters understood this through reading through it, but I guess the, the, the takeaway is that AI is really good at teaching itself over time. And so in this case, it would learn from, you know, the, the times where it was very successful and was in basically maintain a solid, steady connection the entire way through, depending on what the, uh, the um, network conditions are. Yeah. And that's artificial intelligence for you. Mm -hmm. Always learning and learning from itself, too. Uh, TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 2300 UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can be part of the show by emailing us at TNT at twit.tv. You can leave us a short voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. And you can find us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV. And subscribe to the show, twit.tv slash TNT. Subscribe to our other shows. Jason does all about Android. You can subscribe to that at twit.tv. I do iOS Today. Subscribe to that at twit.tv. And if you want to tweet at me about your favorite Lord song, please do. I'm at Megan Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> it's no use for me because I don't know any of her songs by name. But Royals? if you want to. Royals? Royals? Yeah, I don't think so. Maybe if I heard it, maybe yeah. maybe it would be a different okay. story. I'll go home to my Google Home and ask it to play a song, okay. see what I think. Uh, I'm at Jason Howell on Twitter. If you really must send that to me, I will read it, and then I will still be clueless. Uh, thanks to Kevin for switching the show and also editing today. Thanks to Burke and Jammer B for helping out here in the studio. And thanks to you for talking tech with us today. We'll see you all tomorrow. Bye, everybody.